JJ from Get Quorum. Uh, welcome to another of our uh, breakfast and learn events, uh, co-hosted with our friends from uh, Minute Solutions. Uh, if you've never been to our events before, uh, what we do is we, we host uh, sort of like a uh, educational kind of like topic, uh, hot topics in the industry, and, and we bring out a speaker or an expert to uh, kind of like uh, educate you people on that. Uh, really though, it's just kind of an excuse to get our, our friends out, out here uh, to enjoy some food uh, and get, get you guys away from your, your desks. Uh, so two of the hottest topics that we've been seeing come across our desks lately have been uh, Airbnb uh, and marijuana. Uh, and Minute Solutions will attest to this because they're kind of in the thick of things with like board meetings. But uh, you know, like we see a lot of uh, marijuana governance notices in the things that we do. So distributing a lot of like rules packages and, and bans on, on smoking and, and marijuana. So we figured that this was probably like a, a good uh, event to hold. Um, so today we're lucky to have Luis Hernandez. He's a, a six-year uh, industry vet veteran and specializing in uh, condominium law. Uh, Luis is also a CCI board member out in Windsor uh, and has given many topics, uh, uh, sorry, many presentations on the topic of marijuana since uh, last year. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So uh, before I turn it over, just uh, some housekeeping. Um, the presentation will be about 30 minutes and then we'll have a Q&A after. Um, so please hold your uh, questions till the end. Um, how's the food? It's, it's good? Okay. Um, if you're feeling really good, it, it's, it's not because we've laced it with anything. It just means that you guys are, are full and happy and, and stuff like that. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, Luis? Thank you, JJ. Good morning, everyone. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Minute Solutions and Get Quorum for uh, inviting me to speak with you guys today. Um, today, we're going to get into the weeds. We're going to be talking. <laughs> oh, no worries. Um, we're going to be talking about cannabis. As JJ said, this has been a hot topic that I've been having to speak a lot about, um, especially from my legal practice. A lot of clients are asking questions, and just in general, trying to talk to owners, directors, property managers about the effect of cannabis, which is going to be legalized later this year. So to start, I'd like to talk about the current state of cannabis, or the many names that it has right at the top. Cannabis is the cool term now, since that's a legal term. Um, presently, it's still a criminal offense to possess and or smoke marijuana, unless you receive marijuana or cannabis as a medicine, as medicine. Um, right now, there's a medicinal framework that's set up under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. And to obtain medical cannabis, you basically need permission from a medical provider. Um, and they'll give you the reasons of why you're entitled to smoke marijuana. Um, that being said, the future of cannabis is legalization. The Cannabis Act, and we're going to get more specific... Um, more into that in just a second, but the Cannabis Act has already received royal assent, which means that by the end of this year, recreational cannabis will be available in the province of Ontario and the rest of the country. Um, with respect to the government's approach, as you know, we recently had a change in government and the party that's governing. So some of the changes that were originally planned by the previous Liberal government have now been scrapped. So the government is now looking for a different approach with how to regulate cannabis within Ontario. That being said, they're still going to have to function within the framework of the whole Canadian Cannabis Act. Um, so as you can see there, the federal government is targeting October 17th as the recreational legalization date. So now we move on to Bill C-45, the Cannabis Act, and I'm going to try to not get too in the weeds with the legal aspect of things, but just to give you some, um, some context here, the Cannabis Act achieved royal assent at the end of June, June 21st, and originally the provinces said that they would need about 8 to 12 weeks to figure out how they would regulate cannabis selling. Um, the government gave them a little bit of extra time and they said you need to figure your stuff out by October 17th, and we think that that deadline is probably going to be met at this point. So what are the goals of the Cannabis Act? First, it's to restrict youth access, to deter and reduce criminal activity, to protect public health, 
to reduce the burden on the criminal justice system, to provide for the legal production of high quality and regulated cannabis, and to allow adults to possess and access regula um, regulated cannabis as well. And ultimately to raise uh, awareness about the risks related to cannabis. So as you can see, there's a very big focus on health, access to youth, and making sure that people who are consuming cannabis are consuming proper, well-regulated cannabis that's not gonna be laced with anything like your food was, you know, according to JJ. Um, so what can adults do under the Cannabis Act? They can purchase fresh or dried cannabis, cannabis oil, plants, and seed for cultivation. That's going to be what's going to affect you the most, and we'll get to the condominium aspect of it later in the presentation. But you can possess and share up to 30 grams. Uh, you can cultivate up to four plants in your residence. So that's four plants per household. Doesn't mean that if you have four adults, you can cultivate 16 plants. It's a max of four. And you can alter cannabis at home to prepare different types of products. So if you're creating butter so that you can make your brownies or your cookies. However, there are specific rules about using dangerous organic solvents, which is something that can be typically done to extract the THC from cannabis, but that can be really quite dangerous. So the Cannabis Act has put in provisions specifically prohibiting that type of behavior. Um, with respect to cultivation, um, Canadians will be able to purchase their seeds from a provincially regulated retailer or a federally licensed producer. This is what is being reconsidered by the government. Before the change in the government, the Liberal government had said, okay, we're going to sell cannabis the same way that we sell alcohol. They're going to be done through the LCBO. They came out with a store that was called the Ontario Cannabis Store. They had a logo and everything. But recently, Doug Ford's new government has announced that they're going to proceed with privatizing cannabis. They're looking at models similar to British Columbia and Alberta, where private retailers will be permitted to sell cannabis as opposed to the Ontario government through the LCBO. So that still remains to be seen, but right now it's sort of in flux and there's no specific path forward that's been set out because it's a transition period. But as I mentioned, uh, the Cannabis Act allows for individuals to cultivate up to four plants per residence. Prior to the final achieving of Royal Assent, there had been discussions about a height restriction on cannabis plants. That was up to one meter per plant. Uh, the government, I, I personally think rightfully so, scrapped that idea because I can't imagine the police coming into residences measuring cannabis plants and trying to make sure that they're only one meter tall. Um, and finally, individuals wishing to cultivate legal cannabis for personal use must do so themselves. I can't tell my brother to grow four plants for me. That's something that I have to do personally. Edibles. As you can see, there's all sorts of edibles. I'll read a few of them because I like the names. The Keef Cats, the Rasta Reese's, the Butta Fingers. There's, uh, there's all sorts of edibles out there. Um, if you can imagine it, it's probably, it probably exists. The government intends to add edible products to the list of products permitted for sale about a year after legalization. So in October, you'll be able to purchase the actual seeds or the cannabis itself that's been dried or fresh, but cannabis will likely be more around the fourth quarter or third quarter of 2019, um, for the edibles anyways. If anyone wants a three rusted tears, you'll have to wait a little bit. Um, and then for medicinal purposes, um, the current regime will continue to exist. So under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, people who need cannabis for medicinal purposes can get those through permission by their health provider, and that framework will be reevaluated in five years. So, what we're talking about today is just your regular adult who wants to consume for pleasure, not because it's a medicinal need. So, now we get to the effect of cannabis in condominiums. This is what you guys are really here for. And we all wish that everyone could smoke weed like this in their own little bubble, <laughs> not interrupting anyone and not affecting anyone. But that, the reality is that's not quite the case. Um, but in terms of consumption of cannabis, 
I want to take away the fear of your building becoming Woodstock. That's, it's not what's going to happen. Um, but the biggest fear is smoking. How do we deal with smoking? Luckily, that's already a problem that condos have been dealing with for a long time, whether it be cannabis or cigarette smoking. The issue really comes down to the law of nuisance. But our biggest concern is how does someone else's consumption of cannabis affect those around them in the community, the common elements, your neighbors, your units. Um, and really, smoke is both secondhand smoke, which can be a health hazard, and it's an offensive odor. Nobody really likes it. They call it skunk for a reason, because it doesn't smell good. Um, people consuming edibles, not really a big deal to most people. I can't imagine that a 20-year-old playing video games is really going to be a big issue to anyone if they're just eating cookies. I will tell you I've had one file where that was an issue, but that was because the kid was getting so high and playing video games and yelling at the top of his lungs when he was losing at the video games. <laughs> Different circumstance. <laughs> that was a noise issue. <laughs> so the idea is, do you want to be a public nuisance? And the answer is no. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the law of nuisance first, which is basically that the fundamental principle of property is that you are entitled to enjoy quiet use and enjoyment of your property. Um, the tort is, when, is a civil wrong when that nuisance affects somebody. Some, it substantially interferes with somebody's use and enjoyment. So what condos face is really an issue of balancing the rights of an individual in their property the smoker versus the rights of everyone else to not be interfered with by that person's smoke. So what we can do is um, something that we'll discuss in a little bit, but I'm talking about nuisance because that's where smoking plays in. And nuisance, like I said, already exists with secondhand smoking of tobacco or anything else. If someone is burning something in their, in their kitchen and that smoke is transmitting to another unit, that's also a problem. This is the law that will really govern within condos, the cannabis use. So when we get to other cannabis concerns, um, with plants, again, it's not the fear of the growth of a specific type of plant. A tomato plant is similar, or you've got roses, et cetera. But our concern is with people using consumption uh, utilities in a disproportionate way. So if you live in a condominium where your utilities are included in your common element fees and someone is growing a lot of marijuana, it might consume more water or it might consume more electricity. It might also cause a fire hazard because a lot of people are reckless and they get, they get lamps and they don't know how to set them up properly. And of course, the fear of growing operations, which is people who are producing for their own selling or just to distribute with their friends and they're not listening to the four plant per, per residence rule. Um, these are all things that again can be regulated in certain ways and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, production of concentrates, that's for edibles. We were talking about how you can produce butter or you can produce different oils. There's also a concern of using dangerous organic solvents, such as butane, to extract the THC and get real concentrates that people use. Um, that is banned by the Cannabis Act. It's illegal because using butane or dangerous organic solvents in, in enclosed spaces is a huge fire hazard and very dangerous to a lot of people. So the legal solutions to smoking. What can you do? You can change your declaration that requires 80 percent unit approval uh, in written form and the beauty about changing a declaration is that it allows for unreasonable provisions to be made if 80 percent of your mini form of government your condominium have decided that they do not want cannabis in the community that is something that can be put into the declaration but obviously 80 percent is a very high threshold What's happening now is a lot of buildings are being created, Ottawa in particular is big on this, they'll have smoke-free buildings. They'll have buildings that from the get-go, in their declaration it sets out absolutely zero smoking in the condominium, that's what you're buying into. Same with pet-friendly buildings. 
So your declaration is really the supreme document that governs your condominium. However, in the interim, boards can take steps like creating rules that will allow you to promote the security and welfare of residents and really regulate these behaviors. Now, I will say that because this is all very new, there is a lack of consensus in the legal community as to what can and cannot be done in rules. So not to cop out here in a very legal way, but you may want to consult your individual condominium lawyers, your solicitors, with respect to what is appropriate for your community and what it is that you want to implement. There's a requirement under the Condominium Act that rules need to be reasonable, and this is where the debate ranges. We're talking grandfathering, banning all smoking versus just banning smoking of cannabis. I land a little bit more on the side of if you're going to ban smoking of cannabis, you also have to ban smoking of tobacco because the smoke, at the end of the day, both produce an offensive odor, both have particulates in the air that will affect individuals if consumed secondhand. And you really want to give people the opportunity to be grandfathered in when you make these new smoking rules because it would also be unfair for people who have been living in a community and who have been lifelong smokers to all of a sudden be told that you have to quit. So there's really different ways to address both the growing, the smoking, and it really depends on the individual community of how they want to address that. Um, some people are taking more prohibitive stances, and we'll get some clarity on that probably after October 17th, because there will be litigation that will come forward and will sort of draw the line a little bit clearer than what we have right now. Um, but that's why, at least in my view, We've taken it from a nuisance perspective. Attack not the substance, but the effect of the substance on those around you. Like I said, I don't care if someone's having a cookie in my neighbor's unit and it doesn't affect me at all. But I do care if someone's smoking up the house and all of a sudden I'm getting smoke in my unit. The perfect example of this was I was actually at dinner with my aunt yesterday and I have a little four-year-old cousin. This little girl likes to draw outside on her balcony. She likes to, like, she has an easel, she likes to paint. And one of their neighbors smokes a lot of cannabis. So my little four-year-old cousin has now picked up a habit of leaning over the railing and saying, hey, stop smoking weed. <laughs> <laughs> so this is really, yeah, well, she, she's exhausted of the smell and it, it makes sense. She thinks it smells like skunk. But it's, it's amazing to think that a little four-year-old girl now has to deal with that. And my cousin, my uncle has to deal with my four-year-old cousin ingesting secondhand smoke from cannabis. It's a legitimate concern. So there are ways to deal with smoking on the common elements, on the exclusive use common elements like balconies, smoking in your units. Um, and there's a lot of different solutions that need to be tailored for your particular community. So, I want to talk a little bit about medicinal users of cannabis because that's also a big concern. What about the people who need it? Well, you have to, don't encroach on the roach. This is, uh, this is a clip from a very old episode of The Simpsons, but still very relevant. As I mentioned earlier, the Cannabis Act deals with legalization of cannabis for recreational purposes. The medicinal framework will continue to exist. But that doesn't mean that just because someone says, oh man, I have anxiety, you have to let me smoke, that you're going to accept it. They have to have a disability that's recognized under the Human Rights Code. As you can see, Section 2.1 uh, uh, says that every person has a right to equal treatment with respect to the occupancy of accommodation without discrimination because of blah, 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 disability or the receipt of public assistance. With disability, um, there are legitimate purposes to be prescribed cannabis. The question is, does it need to be smoked? Can it be ingested in another way that will help this individual in the same level of effectiveness that won't interfere with your neighbors? So there's a process that the Ontario Human Rights Commission has set out. Um, they've established the fact that it's a shared responsibility. And everyone involved, the people asking for an accommodation and the people who need to provide the accommodation, i.e. the condo, um, need to cooperatively engage in the process. They need to share information and they need to consider potential accommodation solutions. 
So pursuant to the Ontario Human Rights Commission, um, the person with the disability is required to make the accommodation needs known to the best of their ability. So they need to provide you with information as to why they need that accommodation. They need to answer questions and provide relevant information. So if you request medical information, as a board, condominiums and corporations have a, an obligation of confidentiality. They need to protect their unit owner's privacy, but they also need to receive information to be able to provide the appropriate accommodation to the individual. So it's a back and forth relationship. In the same way, the accommodation provider, the condo, needs to accept the request for accommodation in good faith. They need to get expert opinions. They need to bear the cost of any required medical information. So if an individual needs to go back and get a doctor's note or get some tests so that you can make a decision with respect to their accommodation, you're supposed to help them achieve that. So you help by taking an active role in the investigation. The whole point there is that you're trying, again, now to balance the needs of a person who absolutely needs to smoke according to their medical professionals versus the need of everybody else to enjoy their, their units and enjoy the common elements. This is, for many people, their largest investment. They live with young families like my aunt and uncle. Uh, it is something that needs to be balanced and something that over time will become more clearly defined, but right now we're in the initial stages, so communities really need to figure out a cooperative way of dealing with these situations. Now, just to sort of finish the presentation, I wanted to talk a little bit about cannabis in the United States. And the reason I wanted to do that is because lately this has been a subject that I've been talking about, about quite a bit because people are truly afraid that once weed becomes legal, their buildings will, their property will lose value, their buildings will become Woodstock, it's just gonna be a haze on every floor when you get out of the elevator. But the truth is that that's probably not the case. And the reason that it's not the case is because we can look to other jurisdictions, namely the US, which has already taken quite a few steps in terms of legalizing marijuana completely, uh, allowing only for medical marijuana, uh, decriminalizing in some states, and you know, you still have the very light states there who, where it's fully illegal. But what they've ended up showing us is that the issues that they have in Canada are the same issues that we have here. Smoking cannabis in public places, in the lobby, clubhouse, pools, smoking in units, odor and smoke migration, growth of plants. As you can see, Colorado actually permits the growth of six plants as opposed to four per residence. But ultimately, when you're looking at the practical realities, in this day and age, especially in the GTA, especially in Ontario, Cannabis is already ubiquitous. You can walk around the streets and smell it already. It hasn't been a barrier for people, whether or not it was legal, for decades. However, now that it's legal, there's a concern that it's going to increase. But the, the truth is, looking at Colorado, for example, which has been legalized since 2014, they have the best data set, you can see that there really hasn't been an increase in usage both in youth and adults, simply because it was already so freely available. When we go back to the goals of the Cannabis Act, it goes to restricting access to youth, easier to do if you have regulated substances instead of a black market, and reducing criminal activity. So reducing criminal activity, if it becomes legal, again, you're eliminating the black market. You don't have people producing, and the reality is, there's probably gonna be some loss for the producers at the beginning because they're going to try and compete with the mark black, uh, black market rates. But if you look at Colorado, it's quite encouraging to, say, to see that there really hasn't been an increase based on age, gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation. Um, it will likely remain the same. If you already have cannabis problems, you will likely continue to have cannabis problems. If you don't have cannabis problems, you're probably not gonna see an uptick in those issues. However, what we're recommending is that you stay proactive to, if your nuisance rules and your provisions in your declaration aren't as strong as they could be, now is a good time to improve them 
prior to this so that you have an enforcement mechanism to lean back on once cannabis becomes legalized. But it's not this big, scary monster that come October 17th, everyone here is going to smoke weed. I'm pretty sure most people have had access to it. And if you didn't have access to it, I don't think that this is really going to make too much of a difference now. Um, and really, that's the end of my presentation. I took a very high level. No, no one? Uh, there we go. <laughs> I started off corny. I wanted to end corny. Um, so what I'm going to do is very AGM style. I'm just going to take one question at a time to give people in the audience a, an opportunity. I think I need to pass on the microphone. So oh, no, no, you're good. No, you're I'm good. Just, I'm just going to raise the uh, get some light in here. Okay. Um, sorry, I had one over there. Then I'll come back to you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Why wouldn't the government regulate the medical community in regards to? I don't know what doctor would recommend smoking. Honestly, they, my doctor made me quit smoking. Okay, and th and I'm talking cigarettes. Never mind pot. So the government actually already regulates the, the medicinal aspect. Like I mentioned, it's governed under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. But what they've done is they've delegated the authority to medical professionals. And I, I'm not a doctor. I, I don't know under what conditions doctors would prescribe that. It's my understanding that for very serious issues of nausea, cancer patients, people of that sort. But they might not necessarily recommend smoking. Vapor does the same. Sorry. It's still smoking. If you, if you smoke it through a vapor, sure. you, it still works just the same. All your nausea. Correct. And this, is, and, this is, and this is why when we were talking. Yeah. So this is why when we were talking about the accommodation process, it's a dialogue. It's a back and forth between the condominium and the person requesting the accommodation because you can ask those questions. Why does it need to be smoking? Why do you need that particular accommodation? But if you've got a doctor who's advised that that is the most effective way for that person, I don't know under what circumstances that might be, but if that's the case, then that will be how you have to go with the accommodation process. So you're saying that we can legally ask them to Correct. provide this medical... Correct, but it has to be within the... card that can be purchased anyway. Well, you have by to... By any lawyer, by any medical doctor. Ma'am, you have to work with them, right? You have to ask them why they need an accommodation, give you proof of why they need it. It needs to be a disability recognized under the code. Um, but if you've been provided with that information, you have to accept it in good faith. You can't just say that that person just went out and got a card that anybody could get. You, you have to respect that process because the last thing that you want as a condo is a human rights suit against you, right? Um, yes, ma'am. Yeah, no worries. Uh, at the last seminar, emails were sent out to people who attended. And it was a summary of what was presented. So we could present, we could listen to you here, and then afterwards digest. It, will that be done today? Yes. Thank you. I'm told yes. Um, OK, so I'm going to go one, two, three, if that's all right. So can you talk briefly about grandfathering and enforcement? Okay, so I've been asked to talk about grandfathering and enforcement. Grandfathering specifically is a concept of when you apply a new rule, allowing existing people who were not subject to that rule to continue their behavior um, under a certain set of rules um, until a particular amount of time. So if you enact a no smoking rule, but you've got, let's say me for example, that I've been a 10 year smoker, you're not gonna expect me to quit smoking within 30 days. But you would set up a procedure whereby I would go to the property management company or to the board and advise them that I've been a lifelong smoker and be grandfathered until, let's say for example, five or 10 years or until my tenancy is up or until I sell my unit, depending on my circumstances. Um, with respect to grandfathering, this is typically what falls under the ambit of reasonableness under Section 58 of the Condo Act when you're creating rules. So when you're creating rules, you need to be reasonable. If you were to create grandfathering for no smoking, a lot of lawyers right now are taking the position that 
if you were to enact a no smoking rule or a smoke free environment rule, you can grandfather existing tobacco smokers, but because presently cannabis is illegal, you, you would avoid having to grandfather anyone else if you enact your rules prior to October 17th. Again, this is a topic of debate among lawyers. It hasn't been adjudicated on. So there's different opinions of how that may or may not affect your particular community. So I, I cannot emphasize enough going to your own legal counsel to, to, to determine whether that's the appropriate approach. But that is the debate that's going on. And there does need to be a reasonableness aspect to any rules that are created. However, as I mentioned earlier, you can also amend your declaration. Your declaration, which requires 80% written approval of all of the owners, does not need to be reasonable. You can put anything, well not anything, but there are many things that you can put in a declaration that are unreasonable, including no smoking. If you're able to get 80% consensus, the likelihood is that you're not gonna have too many complaints with respect to that new change. However, to do 80% is a much more difficult bar. Um, something that's helped out with services like Get Quorum because they allowed the easy distribution, but at the end of the day, it still makes it a little bit difficult to get that consensus, especially in very large towers, for example, with 700, 800 units, which is becoming more common in Toronto. Um, sorry, yes. Yes, regarding the rules, we have already advertised in our building that this rule is coming and is going to be the legal. So we wanted the options from the residents and nobody has turned up. So what does it state? This is the only place I can get a free advice from a lawyer, actually. <laughs> he, he would have charged me anything. <laughs> So I'm just getting a legal advice from you. We have already done this process and there's no objection from anybody of the residents. So it has become a rule now as per Condo Act. So is, we don't want any changes into the declaration or not. Do we need a change? Because we have already no objections. One month has passed. So it's a rule now. So the rule and by the way, I forgot to address the enforcement part. I'll get back to that in a second. Um, the rule for many condos is a temporary measure. So the beauty about rules is they're easy to, um, to make or amend. It's a board makes the decision of whether or not they want to make a rule. And then a board can also choose to repeal a rule. And all you have to do is provide notice to all of the owners. And unless there is a requisition, it becomes valid. Um, so the rule can be a temporary measure where one board does it and then you have an AGM and you get a whole new board and then that board comes and repeals what you just did, right? So it is a less permanent measure. If you want to solidify it, that is something that you would do through the declaration. But again, that is a much more difficult process. It is it is very difficult to get 80% of unit owners to do anything. It's difficult to get 50% of unit owners to show up and pass a bylaw. I, we struggle with getting 25% of unit owners to fill in a proxy or show up to an AGM. So 80 is, is a very difficult threshold. So you can start off with the rule, which is easy to make or easy to repeal. And then the declaration could be a subsequent step to solidify the, the condo's position. Um, and it makes it board proof, if you will. Um, but I'm just gonna come back. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> uh, we'll come back to you because there's a lot of other people. Um, I didn't actually address the enforcement portion of the previous question. With regards to enforcement, this is something that, same with Airbnb, same with noise, is something that the community itself has to sort of self-police. There's, there's no cannabis police, there's no condo police. At the end of the day, it's owners and residents working with their property management and legal counsel and professionals to follow the appropriate enforcement mechanisms. So if, as an owner, you're experiencing this, you're experiencing smoke migrating into your unit, keep a log. Notify property management every single time. Management will then have to take steps to advise those people that they're breaching the rules, that smoke is migrating into their unit, that it's a problem, and that you need to stop. Eventually, if it doesn't stop, 
very often those files end up coming to my desk. And then that becomes a more difficult procedure because I let them know that they're breaching the rules. And on top of that, they're, they're also responsible for my legal fees because it wouldn't be fair for the rest of the community to pay for my fees to get that person to enter into compliance with something that they should have been complying with in the first place. So then that becomes a problem for people. Um, some people get defiant, some people comply immediately. But there are appropriate enforcement steps along the way that are set out by the Act under Section 134, but that's something that you have to work with management. If management doesn't know that there is an issue, they can't do anything to address the issue. So that's the first step, it's open communication. Is that? In regards to the migration of smoke into the units, um, if a resident who smokes and the smoke is migrating into another unit, whose responsibility is it to stop that migration? Not barring the person from smoking because they have a medical license or a medical permission to smoke, but if the smoke is migrating, is it the owner's responsibility to stop that smoke from migrating or does it fall on the corporation? So that's a, that's a fantastic question and one that there is no clear cut answer for, just because it depends on the circumstance. If the smoke is migrating, let's say because of a building deficiency, it might not be the owner's fault. There's actually, there's case law um, that deals with that exact situation where you had an individual who had been smoking their whole life, but they ended up determining that the issue wasn't with his unit and what was within the bounds of his maintenance and repair obligations, but it was a deficiency of the building. So the building had to take steps to stop that migration. Other times it might be an issue within the unit. For example, your electrical outlets or your vents that aren't properly sealed, and that would be an owner responsibility. So it depends on the circumstance, quite frankly. But you also want to put in measures in place. I know a lot of rules that I've seen lately and or that I've drafted, depending on my client, want rules that say, if you're going to be smoking within your unit, you also need to make sure that everything is cocked around the, the outlets. You need to have air purifiers or air eaters to make sure that there's the minimum, like the least amount of transmission possible. But at some points, you may need to bring in an an engineer, it, it really it depends on the circumstance, but usually your first guess would be it's up to the owner to make sure that it's not happening. If the owner's taken every conceivable step to prevent it and it's still going on, it might be an indicator of a bigger issue. Um, yes, ma'am. So I have a comment that just leads to my question. Um, you had asked why doctors prescribe smoking. So our medicinal system was set up under the hyper government. Um, they set it up the way that they did, specifically labeled as smoking, because they didn't want our pharma, our big pharma industry encroaching on what they saw as future money-making opportunity. And they left it general like that, uh, because vaping technology at the time really wasn't what it is today. So that's my question. How do you feel about not including vaping in a non-smoking rule. I, I've been dealing with this in my condo with someone who has a medical license and, and a happy compromise has been that he now vapes. And the vaping system that he used is top-notch, high-tech, and cut smoking odor by 97%. And since that time, zero complaints. So do you feel, I'm looking at passing this rule right now, vaping is included as you can't do this. Is it actually smarter for the condo to take that out and maybe specify you may vape but you have to use a certain caliber system? Oh, well, that, that's a great question and the, the truth is I, I'm not really sure how I feel. On, on the whole vaping conversation, just because, like you said, there are very different levels and quality of vaporizers out there. But at the end of the day, what they're doing is still taking a product and putting particulates in the air that other people will consume. Um, if the community feels that you can establish 
a, a level of caliber. Um, I've never seen a, a defined standard for quality of vape. Um, I think that would be difficult to enforce in rules because there's, in the same way that air conditioners have BTU and you see allergens and stuff like that, um, ratings on air purifiers, nothing quite exists like that for vaporizers, at least to my knowledge. If someone else knows about that, sorry, no, no okay. Um, so it might be difficult to put that into a rule, but if you have a situation like that in your community, then you can also put in little carve-outs for vaporizers. If you use a vaporizer, maybe let management know. Um, at the end of the day, what matters is whether that person is affecting your neighbor. If there's no more complaints, no more issues, perhaps for your community it is best to not include vaporizers because now you have an example of a person who is able to both consume marijuana and not interfere with other people's enjoyment. Um, but that's because they got the right tools. So you put it into the rule that no smoking, maybe no carcinogen, no burning, you know, other people put in provisions regarding burning as opposed to just the consumption, but you still put in provisions of the air purifier and provisions of if you're going to do it, you have to make sure that you're not producing any odors, right? That will bother people. But I, I don't have a position one way or the other of whether it would be appropriate to take out vaping in all circumstances. Because the moment that you do that, you open yourself to the really cheap vapes that really don't do anything other than just change the ingestion method, right? Um, yes. So in the building I managed, um, the uh, uh, proposal of uh, rule uh, prohibiting marijuana uh, has not been approved. The major consideration is that uh, regarding enforcement and medical marijuana, uh, that is not easy because uh, enforcement is not easy because medical marijuana, uh, so uh, uh, people can get a certificate from a medical practitioner easily. And also, and also there are, uh, in most condominiums, there are rules uh, that uh, says that uh, activities that is regarded as nuisance by the board uh, cannot be continued. So can we rely on that rule uh, to uh, ask people to stop smoking marijuana? Okay, so the medicinal, for the medicinal aspect of this conversation brings you into the human rights realm. So with human rights, you're supposed to accommodate an individual up to a point of undue burden. That's the legal standard. Um, what you want to do in those situations is you want to accommodate as much as possible. And that also, as I was saying earlier, is a cooperative process. The person who's consuming needs to understand that they can't be a nuisance to other people. But the board can't deem the smoking in that circumstance just a nuisance and tell them to stop because they do suffer a disability that's code protected. And if they provided you with the documentation saying that they can, then really they can. But you can discuss the method of ingestion, um, what they're doing to make sure that smoke isn't transferring through units. And with enforcement, this is where we go from the recreational to the medicinal and we have to look at the different methods. Enforcement first comes from notification. Property management needs to be aware of what's going on. They need to investigate. They need to document their investigation. So if you go outside, you know, unit number 12 and you hear, like you smell the smoke that's originating from there, then that makes part of your investigation. Then you determine, is it a person who's smoking recreationally or someone who's smoking for medicinal purposes? And that determination will help you figure out how you're going to proceed with the enforcement, how you're going to deal with this individual going forward. And if it's medicinal, you enter into the accommodation process. You get information, you find out what is their disability, why they need to smoke, and why there's transference from their unit to the common elements or to other units. With the recreational, that might be covered under a rule or a provision under your deck, but there is no concern there of a human right issue because if you're smoking recreationally, it means that it's not because you have a need, it's because you have a desire, right? It's the same as consuming alcohol or eating anything that you might eat in your own home. 
Um, so at that point, that's strictly governed by nuisance law. Medicinal, that's uh, the different range. So I'm going to go there and then back to you. So my question is in regards to uh, landlords and tenants, uh, because most condominiums are about 10, from 10 to 40% tenants. So um, I advise landlords, future landlords, I advise them to put non-smoking for their units. It's your right as well to request, like you say, I want, when you request, when you sign the lease at the beginning, you put all the condition, no partying, no alcohol, I know. We're, we're going to the human rights thing, but uh, if you sign a lease with a landlord saying no smoking in my unit, then the person accepted that fact, they're already, it's a contract. Now, they breach that contract. You take them to the kangaroo court, which is the tribunal, landlord and tenant, <laughs> tenant, are they prepared to deal with these cases because there is a breach of contract? So the landlord and tenant board, are they prepared? Is that what you're asking me? Yes. Yeah. No, but, but, but the tenant will sign the lease saying no smoking is written there, no smoking, no pets, whatever the landlord feels like they want to live in that lease. The tenant accepted that, no pets and no smoking. Now, the individual comes in and now they're smoking recreational, forget the medicine, sure. recreational marijuana. As a landlord, Management advice you tell them to smoking and you can read no smoking, no text. What are you going to do? Okay. So, well, the question revolves around what do you do when you've got a tenant who signed a lease that has a no smoking provision and they're breaching that provision in their lease? So, I'm going to address this with a condominium lens first. As a condominium, you are entitled to enforce the provisions with respect to the owner, not the tenant. There's two separate relationships. There's the relationship between the condominium and the owner and the landlord-tenant relationship that exists between the owner and the tenant. Um, you, as a condominium, have to enforce the rules by way of the owner. The owner is obligated under Section 119 to ensure that their occupants, their tenants, their guests, their family, everybody, um, abides by the rules. And then, on a separate notice, the landlord has a relationship with the tenant, and that's governed by the Residential Tenancies Act. It's a different relationship. So, as a condo, you can advise your landlord, the owner, that their tenant is breaching the rules, that they have to show you that they're taking the appropriate steps to deal with that within the bounds of their landlord-tenant relationship. But the condominium can't necessarily take steps against the tenant immediately unless it's an aggravated issue. You have to take the, the owner and the tenant to court because the, the offending problems continue with persistence. But again, these are unique circumstances that you have to deal with. The condo is by no means interested in what the provisions of the lease are. The condo is interested in the the condo is interested in the declaration, the bylaws and the rules. They're also interested in the condominium act. So the condominium act says that if you're an owner and you're leasing under section 83, you have to provide your tenant with all of the condo documents. You have to advise them of the rules and the bylaws and you need to provide notice to the corporation that you have a tenant and that that tenant and this is under 119, is following all those rules, declarations, and bylaws that you've provided them with. So at that point, a condominium, when it comes to enforcement, can tell the owner, hey, you're a landlord. Landlord, you have to make sure that your guy is following all the rules. And you gave us a copy of your lease. We also note that in your lease that says no smoking, you can use that to go to the landlord and tenant board. Okay, so, sorry, I'm going to go, there's one, so two, three, four. I'm really sorry, it's just kind of... Uh, uh, oh, okay. Um, my question is Louder, that... Please. Sure. Um, my question is that there are corporations that have been around for years and sometimes decades without any smoking bans. And like you mentioned, from a nuisance perspective, cigarettes and weed are very similar. Um, and now everyone's running to get their bylaws or rules passed. Could one argue that it is 
it's based on timing that it's discriminatory because it's obviously geared towards marijuana because smokers are now going to be grandfathered in and marijuana users are not. So the, the question is, there's been pre-existing rules about smoking. Now that cannabis is coming down the pipeline, um, can it be argued that it's discriminatory behavior to pass rules regulating cannabis? Would that be? Yeah, for buildings that have never had. Okay, for buildings that have never had smoking bins. So, first of all, anything can be argued. The question is, can it be argued well? Um, and the answer is probably not, because a condo is entitled to pass rules at any time that they view as being necessary for the security or welfare of the corporation. Um, it also wouldn't be discriminatory, because discrimination has very specific... Um, I, I guess elements or there are specific ways that you can be discriminated by pursuant to the Ontario Human Rights Code. That includes age, gender, sex, disability, and everything. And I, like there's a bunch of, I think there's like 13 categories, including family status. Um, I've never heard of stoners being a protected ground, to be honest. <laughs> so um, I don't think it would be discriminatory. In fact, it would be a board acting within their, their duties to actually govern the, the condominium if they think that that is what the community really wants. But it wouldn't surprise me if there is at some point a human rights complaint that makes that exact argument. I don't think it would go very far, but I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'm um, sorry, I had you, then I had you. Taking into consideration uh, medical access and the ease of uh, prescriptions, uh, how intrusive can the corporation be during dialogue once um, a cannabis user puts their feet down and says, well, I have a medical license and I don't feel that I have to tell you anything more than that about my disability or the, the type of consumption? How, much, how intrusive can the corporation become to force that information to come to light? Okay, so I wouldn't frame it as being intrusive. Like I said, this is a cooperative process. So if you show up, and this, I see this a lot with uh, guide dogs, for example. There are certain organizations that um, will license pets for emotional support or whatever it may be. I'm, I'm using this as an equivalent scenario. Um, there's a case out there, it's called uh, Simcoe Condominium Corporation 89 and Dominelli that deals with a dog situation where you had an individual who was claiming that they had a therapy dog and that they had a card um, and then they provided a doctor's note and the doctor's note simply said this is an emotional support dog. That was found to not be sufficient for the courts. The courts have determined that the corporation needs to do its due diligence to provide the appropriate accommodation. If you've given me a card saying that you're entitled to smoke marijuana, that's fantastic. But I need to know what code protected disability you have that entitles you to that accommodation. Because anyone with a computer and a card printer could create a card of themselves, right? But if you get a medical note, you would have to pay for the cost of that person obtaining the medical note. But it's a process whereby you obtain as much information as possible to provide the accommodation. You just you have to accept it in good faith though. So if they just come with the card, you can ask them for more. This is one of those situations where, again, you wanna ask your legal counsel how intrusive you can get based on your specific situation. But a fair ground rule is what the disability is, what the accommodation that they require is, and why that accommodation is required. So again, do you need to smoke it? Can you ingest it as a concentrate? Can you vape it um, instead of smoking? Those are all questions that you're allowed to ask. And the person requesting the accommodation also has a duty to be part of that process. If they show up, they give you the card and say, well, I'm just gonna smoke, that's not participating in the process and they've, they haven't discharged their duty in the process. Yeah, um, sorry, I had back there, yes. I just, <laughs> I just wanted to find out from if you know of any opinions or studies that 
more or less um, determine that the use of continuous continuous use of marijuana affects one like mentally negatively. How do you know of any? Um, on that subject, I, I'm not a medical professional by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I do read a lot. And one of the bigger issues with these types of studies that you're talking about is that it hasn't been legal before and, and it hasn't been legal to do studies. So there are suspicions, I guess, that there are long-term health effects what they are, we don't know. In the United States, it's been classified as the highest level of drug on par with cocaine, and studies haven't been permitted um, for many institutions in the United States. So the long-term health effects, I, I'm not really sure. But I think it's safe to say that whenever you're putting something into your body, there is likely to be some outcome or effect that might not be the healthiest. Please, uh, yeah. don't <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're getting political. Yes. yes. One more. Okay, so this is going to be the last question. Oh, okay. Who wants the last question? All right, got you over there. Oh, you don't, okay, two questions. <laughs> okay, so my question is, um, so if you have a rule in place and um, you don't have a big problem with smoking or kind of this right now, can you pass a declaration even after it becomes law. Uh, yeah. Sorry, so pass a new rule or amend the declaration? Yeah, yeah. So you can do a new rule or amending the declaration at any point in time. Um, one of the biggest points of argument has been with respect to passing a rule before or after the legalization date because of the grandfathering aspect. If you pass after October 17th, does that mean that you will have to grandfather pot smokers as well? If you, ban if you create the rule now, presumably you wouldn't have to grandfather pot smokers because it's presently illegal. So you, they had no legal right to do that in the first place. After October 17th, the argument is they are legally allowed to smoke recreationally and a rule would take that away. So you get recreational users grandfathered as well. The, there are different schools of thought on the subject, and it really, you'll ask five lawyers, they'll get five different opinions on it, but that, those are sort of the range of options. But to amend the declaration, you can do that whenever. That, that is something that is done as a community that affects your fundamental document, being your declaration. It's why it's so difficult to amend. There is no reasonable component required in a declaration change. There's no rush to do yeah. a declaration if you have no problem right now. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. And last. Um, going back to the uh, lease situation, does the corporation have a right at the time an owner is leasing to see the lease itself? Yeah. yeah. Okay, the second question is, if they are not including a non-smoking provision, my understanding is they have the opportunity at the next time the lease is renewed but cannot force it in the interim, so they are in effect grandfathered. Um, that, that is a, a landlord and tenant issue between the owner and the tenant. Um, it's not something that the condominium can force governance of that relationship unless there are provisions in your declaration. So many provisions of declarations state um, there needs to be a statement in the lease that says that they've received this or that they're doing these things. I am not arguing that. that, that okay. Point. You made that clear before. The right. question is, can we see the lease when it is in force? to know whether or not well, they have included it, because if well, our only well, so, the owner, okay. we have to go So under it. Section 83, any, every owner who leases their unit has to provide the corporation with a copy of that lease, always. Right. Yeah. Also, the, um, the owner is obligated to give the rules of the corporation to that tenant. Yes. So yeah. any rules of the corporation that ban smoking would automatically fall, whether yes. it's in their lease or not. Right. So. Um, Dean makes a very good point, which is what I had emphasized earlier, which is under Section 83, not only are you, are you the condo entitled to receive a copy of that lease, um, 
and receive notice that it's being leased, you can enforce that the owner provides the, con the owner with all of that information. And on top of that, there's been changes to the Condominium Act as well. So when a corporation receives information about, let's say, a new owner, a new owner gets given the same package. So it's sort of the same idea. Property management companies can take the, the approach of the same new owner information certificate that they would provide new owners, they can have a condensed version that they would provide to tenants in case they're concerned that the owner isn't discharging his or her duties and providing them with the declaration bylaws and rules in any event. But a tenant is subject both to their lease and to the Condo Act and all of the rules and bylaws and declarations of the condominium. And I think with that, I'm unfortunately out of time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I actually, I, I have one question for you. How, how many marijuana files do you have on your desk right now? Yes. Most of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, so thank you, everybody, for coming out. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed the, uh, the event. Uh, thank you, Louise. Uh, thank you to our friends at Minute Solutions. Um, you're going to stick around for a little bit if yeah, some people have, uh, have questions. If you guys want to mingle, please enjoy the, uh, the food and the coffee that's still around. Um, thank you. We'll